Good morning. My name is Matt Bechtel. I'm an attorney with the Green Law Group. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, new COVID-19 employment considerations. Uh, however, I will warn you that if you've viewed some of our previous webinars regarding COVID, you will see some familiar themes. Um, there is a lot that's new to them, um, but there's, there's, there's a lot of laws that were basically just reenacted recently. Um, that will be a large focus today. And before we continue, we want to thank our sponsors who make these uh, webinars possible, Easy Law Construction Notices, Ventura County Credit Union, the Ventura County Contractors Association, the Blue Book, and uh, Builders Book Incorporated. As always, we have to give you a warning. The information we're going to talk about today is general in nature. You shouldn't construe it as legal advice, although we do uh, strive to make sure everything is accurate. Uh, the law is always fact specific. And if you have any specific questions, you should contact us uh, before relying on um, what's said in here because it may not apply specifically to your situation. Now, the Green Law Group is a uh, full service law firm. We uh, primarily represent construction professionals uh, in contracts, licenses, and other notices. We also represent um, clients in all employment matters. My practice uh, is primarily focused on employment law. Uh, most of our clients are in the construction field, so I do have some familiarity with uh, the construction field as well. Uh, but, but a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about will be applicable to pretty much any employer as well. A shameless plug of our wonderful faces. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about basically about four different topics. Um, and again, some of these you might have heard of before, some of them are new, um, but they all apply to, are, are still applicable and apply going forward and they all relate to COVID. The first is the Families First Corona Response Act. I think this topic has come up every in every webinar I've given in the last year. Uh, this is a law that just won't die. It initially was intended to end at the end of December of 2020. It was briefly uh, extended in a minimal form until March 31st, 2020, uh, 2021. Um, and then last month, it was again revived to the American Rescue Plan Act through September of this year. Last month, California also passed a supplemental sick pay law that is going to sound very familiar because it overlaps with the FFCRA in many ways. There's also some differences that we'll talk about. Uh, last year, uh, in December of 2020, California's uh, CalOSHA uh, issued emergency standards that uh, became effective in late December and are still effective going forward. There's nothing new regarding these standards, so we're gonna cover them very briefly. And the last issue we'll talk about is uh, vaccination policies in, in the workplace. Um, this is just a question that we get often um, since vaccines are now generally widely available and a lot of employers would like to uh, mandate that their employees uh, receive the vaccine. So the first topic today is gonna to be the uh, FFCRA, or the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Again, this was a law that was passed basically about a year ago. It became effective in April of 2020. It applied to all employers with fewer than 500 employees, and it basically had two components. It had a mandatory sick leave requirement that basically provided 80 hours of sick leave for full-time employees and a uh, pro rata share for part-time employees. And it also had an extended uh, family medical leave component that applied to um, employees who had to miss work because their kids were out of school or weren't in daycare for COVID-related reasons. Now, the FFCRA had a payroll tax subsidy that covers the cost of any sick pay you had to provide to employees. So in the end, the employer had to front the money for the uh, um, for the paid leave, but they eventually would get it back in the form of a uh, payroll tax deduction, uh, provided that the employees were taking it for covered reasons. As I said before, that law actually expired on December 31st, 2020. The tax subsidy was extended in December to March 31st, 2021. By the tax sub subsidy, what I mean is the mandate 
went away, but employers could choose to optionally provide FCRA benefits through the 31st, and they could still get the tax credit uh, for doing so. Now, the FFCRA um, basically had six eligibility requirements. The last one was one that really wasn't implemented at all. It was, it was, it was kind of a catch-all that allowed the um, government to expand the reasons why. But basically, there was um, five reasons why you could take leave. First three are basically you were ordered to be quarantined um, by a, fe uh, a federal, state, or local government. Um, you've been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine related to COVID-19, or you're experiencing COVID symptoms and you are seeking medical diagnosis. It also applied to anybody who was um, caring for someone who meet, met those standards. Now, the uh, sick leave component also applied to any employee who was caring for a child um, who was out of school or out of daycare for a COVID-19 related reason. Now, the, um, in addition to the additional the sick pay requirement, which provided 80 hours of, of uh, paid sick leave, the FFCRA also provided up to 12 weeks or 10 additional weeks of leave for anyone who was caring for a child who was out of uh, school or, or, or daycare as a result of COVID. Now, the benefits under the FFCRA um, were basically full pay for the 80 hours of leave, except for when you're caring for a child or when you're caring for somebody else who, who had a qualifying reason. Uh, but the full pay was capped at $511 per day. Um, for the other reasons, you basically got paid up to two thirds your total pay or up to a cap of $200 per day. Now, last month, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan Act, which was the, the, the most recent COVID stimulus bill. And the law had many provisions related to COVID. The one we're going to talk about today is how it affects the FFCRA. Now, the, now the, the American Rescue Plan Act extended the tax credits for paid sick leave and paid family leave through September 30th of this year. Um, it also expanded eligibility by adding three additional reasons of why you could take FFCRA coverage. Those reasons are the worker is getting a COVID-19 vaccine, the employee is recovering from complications due to receiving the vaccine, or the worker is awaiting the results of a COVID-19 test or diagnosis. Now, just like the previous extension, the, the uh, American Rescue Plan Act does not extend the mandate, so, so employers are not required to provide FFCRA coverage, and, and the law still only applies to employers with uh, 500 or fewer employees. But if you do choose to provide FFCRA benefits, the, the American Rescue Plan Act does reset the 10-day uh, limit for leave as of April 1st, 2021. Uh, so if an employee took leave either last year or prior to April 1st, 2021, and you were offering FFCRA leave to the first three months of this year, uh, that doesn't can't be used against them, and they can use an additional 10 days starting April 1st going forward. Now, the American Rescue Plan Act did not reset the time limit for the, the uh, family leave component of um, FFCRA. So if an employee took you know, for example, 12 weeks of leave last year or prior to April 1st for um, you know, caring for a child who was out of school or work, they won't get any additional benefit now if you choose to provide FFCRA benefits. Now, the one change they did make, however, is FFCRA now, the extended leave now applies to all of the qualifying reasons. So instead of an employee only being able to take 12 weeks of leave for, to care for um, a child who's out of school or work, they can also take 12 weeks of leave for um, based on quarantine order, um, based on seeking medical treatment because they have COVID or any of the reasons under the FFCRA. And we'll talk a little bit later about should you offer FFCRA, again, it's not mandatory that you do, and we'll, we'll, we'll cover some of these um, cost-benefit analysis uh, a little bit later in this uh, webinar. 
So in a related matter, the uh, California Supplemental Sick Pay. Now, last year after FFCRA was enacted, California passed a California Supplemental Sick Pay law that basically mirrored FFCRA, but it applied to employers with 500 or more employees, and it also applied to certain industries. The purpose of it was to basically bring all California employers in line with FFCRA as far as the benefits provided. Uh, last month, California passed a, a new supplemental sick pay law that applies to employers with more than 25 employees. Now, this law was actually neg uh, negotiated and, and enacted before the FFCRA extension was actually um, put into law. Um, so the, the intent of the law was to extend FFCRA benefits, even though the government may not have done that. In the end, the FFCRA was extended, but again, it was extended on a voluntary basis. Uh, California Supplemental Sick Pay Law is not voluntary. If you have more than 25 employees, you must provide the benefits. Now, under this, the Supplemental Sick Pay Law, if you have more than 25 employees, your full-time employees get up to 80 hours of, of paid leave um, for various reasons that we'll talk about in a moment. The um, Whether or not you're full-time depends on one of two things. A, if you, if, if you typically consider an employee full-time, no matter how many hours they work, you have to treat them as full-time for this law and, and, and pay them based on 80 hours. If you don't typically treat the employee as full time, the, the law looks at whether they, the employee worked at least 40 hours in the, in the previous two weeks before they took leave. And if they did, they, they're considered full time and they get the full benefit. Now, if an employee is not full time, the California Supreme Sick Pay Law has, has various methods to determine how many hours the employee gets. Typically, the employee is going to get the uh, number of hours they normally work in a week. But if you have an employee that works a variable number of hours, you actually need to go back and look at the average number of hours they worked per day and you multiply that by 14 to determine how many hours they get. The period that you look at uh, as far as that calculation ultimately depends on how long they work for you. So for example, if they've worked for you for more than six months, you would go back six months. Now, just to be clear, the, the, the calculation method is based on the total number of days within the period. So for example, if you take six months, figure out how many days that is and figure out the average number of hours worked each day over that entire period, including weekends, um, that's the number you multiply by 14 to determine the number of hours that you must give your variable um, your employee works variable hours now, again if the employee doesn't work variable hours you know works part-time but only um you know a set hour every week you just have to pay them based on the, the normal hours that they work now the california simple sick pay law became effective march 29 2021 but it's retroactive from january 1st 2021 what that means is uh any employee that requests leave for a qualifying reason from March 29 forward, you have to give them the, the um, supplemental sick pay. If the employee took leave for a qualifying reason prior to March 29th, but, but have, uh, on or after January 1st, 2021, uh, you have to pay them the benefit on the next paycheck if the employee requests it. Uh, if the employee doesn't request it, you do not have to um, go back and retroactively apply it. But if they do ask for it, you do have to immediately buy the next paycheck, pay the amount. Now the California Supplemental Sick Pay Law, just like FFCRA expires uh, at the end of September, 2021, um, if an employee is on a qualifying leave as of September 30th, uh, 2021, they can continue that leave and still get the benefit uh, until they you know, ultimately return. Now, the employee does get to decide whether um, to use California Supplemental Sick Pay. You generally can't force them to do it. Um, they get to pick the amount of time they need, provided it's a qualifying reason. 
But there is one exception built into the law, which is if an employer is mandated under the Cal OSHA standards that we'll talk about in a second, uh, in that situation, you can require the um, employee to exhaust their supplemental sick pay leave first. Um, and the reason that's important is the Cal OSHA standard actually mandates that you provide benefits to an employees, uh, to certain employees who are on quarantine, for example. Now there's also a notice requirement for the uh, supplemental sick pay law. Um, we, we will provide a copy. The, the uh, DIR has, has, has created a poster that, that you can download, but we will provide a copy of that poster and, and uh, distribute it along with uh, the PowerPoint of this, uh, uh, when we distribute this PowerPoint. There's also a requirement, which is a little different than the FFCRA, that you must report supplemental sick pay on your paychecks. Um, it should be a separate line. Now, California already mandates that every employer provide at least three days of sick pay. Uh, in certain locations, certain counties, you have to provide up to six days of sick pay. The supplemental sick pay is in addition to that. And under both sick pay laws, you do have to report the number of hours the employee has available on their pay stubs, or you could do it on a separate report that's provided with their pay stubs uh, each period. The easiest way, of course, is just to have it on the pay stubs. And that's the normal procedure that most employers do follow. Now, the California Supplemental Sick Pay Law, uh, law applies if the employee is unable to work or telework for any of the following reasons. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them because they're all going to look very familiar. This basically overlaps uh, exactly with the FFCRA law as it was uh, ex you know, extended and expanded um, recently. So it basically covers all of the reasons that FFCRA previously covered. It also covers the reasons related to vaccinations. It's important to note that the California Supplemental Sick Pay Law does not have the extended FMLA requirement. Um, it, only, it, it only provides up to the 80 hours of sick pay, but it includes the same reason, that is being able to care for a child um, who is either out of school or out of daycare due to COVID-related reasons. Um, and we'll talk about in a moment the differences between um, or, or, or whether or not you should expand FFCRA um, in light of both of these laws. Now, the benefits for uh, California Civil and Sick Pay, um, we already talked about the number of hours you have to give each employee. Basically, you have to pay the employees at their normal rate of pay, the state minimum wage or the local minimum wage, whatever, whichever one is higher. Um, Hopefully you're all paying at least the state or local minimum wage. So really you just have to pay them with their regular rate of pay. However, it is still capped at $511 per day. So if your employers make more than $511 per day, you don't have to pay them um, more than that amount. Uh, it should be noted here that under the California sick pay law, the cap is $511 per day for all um, reasons for leave. Whereas at FCRA, the cap is lower if you are um, caring for a child who's out of school um, or, or out of daycare due to COVID, or caring for a family member who has a, um, you know, a qualified reason to be out of work. So, so here in California, as long you may still have to pay more than you would under the FFCRA law. So last year in November, Cal OSHA issued uh, emergency standards that, that apply to all employers, uh, most employers. The, the standards don't apply to certain employers that are bound to a, a, a um, separate aerosol requirement. Mostly these are um, healthcare workers. Um, so for, for most employers, these standards will apply if they're not in the healthcare field. For most of our clients in the construction industry, these are the standards that will apply. Now, the, the emergency standards that were promulgated requires all employers to basically create a COVID safety plan that um, includes three specific categories. The, the Cal OSHA has issued a sample um, 
plan that you can actually download. We've actually put together a separate um, plan that, that also meets the requirements. Uh, the basic requirements are in the plan, you have to identify and evaluate employee expo uh, potential ex employee exposures to COVID-19. Um, you have to implement effective policies and procedures to, to limit and correct any problems. Uh, and you have to provide um, PPE, basically. Specifically, you must mandate that they wear masks. Um, the standards also require you to provide any required PPE to keep your employees safe. Exactly what PPE will apply will ultimately depend on, on your business practices. Um, the, the standards also require you to provide training to your employees on the techniques that you're going to follow and, and to, to, to inform your employees of, of the steps that you're going to, you have taken to prevent COVID exposure. Now, the uh, standards also require, and this is, there's actually a separate law that was passed last year and that, that overlaps with these standards, um, but, but the standards also require all employers to report outbreaks to the local health department. An outbreak is currently defined as 30 or more cases within a 14-day period. The actual definition of an outbreak can vary based on location because the local health department can issue their own definition. As far as I know, I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, jurisdiction that has changed the definition from what's here. Uh, it also defines a major outbreak as 20 or more cases within a 30-day period. Um, you must report any outbreaks to your local health department. Uh, the, the regulations say you must do it immediately, but it also says that no later than 48 hours. Uh, so as a practical matter, make sure within 48 hours of learning of an outbreak, meaning learning of that third case within 14 days, you want to notify your local health department. And the standards do require employers to test employees uh, if they're, they've been potentially exposed at the workplace. The potential exposure is basically um, if there's a connection, if there's a positive case that you can connect to the workplace, any employee who's been within uh, six feet for more than 15 minutes of that employee uh, needs to be tested, and that has to be at the employer's expense. Uh, employers must maintain records and track all COVID-19 cases. Uh, there are confidentiality requirements as far as um, releasing that information, but you should be keeping records of every case that you have so that if there is an outbreak, it can be provided to the health department. Um, when there is a COVID-19 serious illness, uh, Cal OSHA and federal OSHA define serious illness basically as requiring inpatient hospitalization or a death. Uh, you must report this to actually, uh, uh, you know, the, the serious um, health condition or the death to Cal OSHA um, directly. Um, the regulations also require you to follow certain quarantine requirements. Uh, the quarantine requirements are basically the same as the testing requirements. Anybody, any employee who's been potentially infected at work or is that potentially exposed at work needs to be quarantined. The quarantine period should be 14 days. Um, a few of the things that I guess I'm not in here I should cover. Um, you can't require your employees to be tested um, in order to return from work from a quarantine. So if you do require your employees to quarantine because A, they either have a positive test or they were just at risk, you can't mandate that they um, get a test in order to return. Instead, you must uh, use a time-based system, which is basically allow them to stay home for 14 days. And after the 14 days has elapsed, then they can return to the workplace. So with all that being said, the big question is, should you provide FFCRA benefits to your employees? As I said before, it is 100% optional at this point. It's been optional since January 1st of this year. The big benefit of FFCRA is that it does provide a uh, tax incentive to, to uh, provide it because you can get reimbursed for any amounts you have to pay your employees. California Supplemental Sick Pay Law doesn't have that. So if you, since you have to require your, your assuming you have over 25 employees, since you have to require 
or allow your employees to take sick leave, it would seem it would be beneficial for you to provide FFCRA benefits, because at least that way you get reimbursed for it. But there's a few pitfalls here. First, the uh, FFCRA benefits Our office is right next to the train track. Um, the uh, the FFCRA um, uh, law expressly states that it, it is in addition to any other leave laws. As I said previously, the purpose of this California Supplemental Law was actually passed before FFCRA was enacted and was intended to extend the benefit. So it's not 100% clear whether or not you would be required to provide uh, FCRA and supplemental sick pay, um, but based on, on how FFCRA is written, most likely that is the case. So if an employee, for example, wanted to, you know, if took two weeks, 80 hours of leave under FFCRA, you'd have to provide them those benefits. Um, you would get reimbursed for that time, but then if that employee again wanted to take another 80 hours under California's um, supplemental sick pay law, there's a good argument that says they have the right to do that, and for that second sick pay, they, you, know, you won't be able to get reimbursed. However, as a practical matter, the law is only in effect until September 30th of this year, and you got to weigh the likelihood that your employees are going to have two qualifying reasons to take leave within, you know, the next six months or so before the law expires. Um, the other issue is FFCRA must be offered to all employees to get reimbursed. So you can't have a policy that, that certain employees can, can receive it and other employees cannot receive it. Um, condition, um, it's unclear whether or not you have to provide both extended family leave and the sick pay uh, component to all of your employees. Now, if you were to enact FFCRA benefits just for the sick pay requirement, but not the extended family leave requirement, you might be able to get reimbursed for that. Um, and if not, you're really uh, no worse off, other than the fact that you're taking the risk of having to provide benefits of both, both under FFCRA and under the sick pay law. Um, ultimately, it's up to you to decide if you want to provide the extended FFCRA benefits. Um, if you have employees that tend to take advantage of, of sick leave laws, you might not want to do it. You got to remember, under FFCRA, if you're providing both benefits, it essentially provides up to 14 weeks of leave because the extended family medical leave component now applies to everything, you know, all qualifying reasons under the FFCRA. Um, now, if you have employees that already took it last year, again, it's not an issue. But if you have employees that have, have not taken any extended family leave, they could potentially take off 14 weeks and you would be required to pay them for those 14 weeks. Under FFCRA, you can get reimbursed for it as long as it's for a qualifying reason. So last thing we're going to talk about is vaccines. Um, I've had a lot of questions recently of, can I mandate that my employees get vaccinated? The answer to that question is, it's going to be a very loyally answer, maybe. Uh, generally, there's, there is quite a bit of case law on this, and generally, it is allowable to mandate that your employees get vaccinated. This, this has been an issue that's been around for years and related to things like the flu vaccine, and uh, the general consensus is an employer can mandate that an employee get a vaccine uh, as part of as condition for working. The problem with the COVID vaccine is the COVID vaccines are currently issued under an emergency order um, you know, for emergency use. So it, it didn't go through the normal uh, process in order to be approved. There is 
unclear, the law is very unclear regarding whether or not an employee, uh, anybody, a government or an employer could mandate that an employee use, uh, have, their, have their employees get vaccinated um, in a, uh, with a vaccine that, that is, is basically authorized for emergency use only. The, the regulations are kind of indicate both ways. On one hand, they indicate, yes, you can, um, but there's other parts of it that, that seem to indicate that you cannot. Um, until there's more guidance, our recommendation would be not to mandate vaccines. Um, now, I do think you will see in the near future specific guidance or even specific laws allowing the vaccines to be mandated. And once that happens, I don't see an issue with you mandating. At this point, if you want your employees to be vaccinated, our recommendation is to encourage it. I mean, you can offer to pay for it. Um, you can make arrangements for vaccines to be given you know, at the workplace um, without actually mandating your employers um, get the vaccine. Now, if you do decide to mandate that your employers get the uh, employees get the vaccine, again, you're probably okay doing it. Um, you know, it's it's the law is not clear on it, but but you know, based on historical precedent and the current regulations, most likely it, it is allowable. However, there's a few restrictions that have always been in place for mandatory vaccines that you would still have to follow. Um, first, whenever you mandate anything as part of your employment, you're going to have to pay for it. Um, second, you have to accommodate protected classifications. In terms of vaccines, the, the two most common class, uh, um, protected classifications you see are disability claims um, and, and religious-based claims. If an employee comes forward and says that, that their religion prohibits them from getting vaccinated or that they have a health condition, um, and, they, and most likely they'll provide a doctor's note saying that they can't get vaccinated, in that case, you don't want to require those employees um, to get vaccinated. The last thing I, I would point out too is at this point, vaccinations are not widely available to everybody, especially if you have a younger workforce. And that's likely going to end in a matter of, of, of days, if not weeks. Uh, I think the most recent um, federal guideline is vaccines will be available to everybody by April 19. Um, but until it is available to everybody, and even if it's available, there's still an issue of whether or not you can actually get an appointment and get vaccinated. If you're going to require your employees to be vaccinated, you do have to make sure that um, it's available um, and it's possible for them to comply with the requirement. You don't want to terminate an employee for not getting vaccinated when they weren't able to. So in the end, our recommendation is at this point, I wouldn't mandate the vaccine. If you want your employees to be vaccinated, encourage it, um, offer to pay for it, but don't require it. Uh, I do think you'll see specific guidance or, more, or specific laws in the coming months that will say definitively whether or not you can require it or not. At that point, you can make the determination. So with that, uh, we're open to answer any questions you might have. Looks like we don't have any questions, so. Well, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to uh, contact us. My email is matthew at the You can also feel free to give us a call um, as well. And uh, thank you for attending the webinar.